had a fairly, you know, successful investment, if I may say, in Cafe Coffee Day. We've just seen this entire FDI in retail, this Big Bang announcement. How do you see that playing out? Do you see big bucks lining up like yours to get into that and fund them? See, firstly, we haven't finished the investment in Cafe Coffee Day, right? So okay. we're still invested. So only time will tell where, where it all comes out. But I think retail businesses in general that have been involved with the company. Oh, yeah, been involved for two and a half years now. Look, I think retail is a very interesting business in India. I think even that report talks a lot about mm -hmm. consumer-facing businesses and, you know, we do a lot of those investments in China and in the world. KKR has done a lot of retail investments. In India also, it seems very attractive, but when you get down to the retail businesses, they are very, very challenging in this country. I think if you really want to look at what challenges businesses face, you really have to see the build-up of these consumer-facing businesses of all kinds. I'm not just referring to uh, the QSR business. Uh, but if you get that right, I think you you really uh, have phenomenal upsides because there's a brand that's in the face of the consumer every day. The, you're playing to the demographic dividend of half the population of India being under the age of 30. Uh, per capita income is going up. Aspirational buying is going on. So there's a lot in these consumer businesses that, that we like. But as I said, between all the supply side constraints in this country, you know, poor infrastructure, poor power supply, shortage of people, wage inflation, uh, you know, it all comes to bear on retail businesses as you try to grow distribution, if you really want to be a sort of a scaled player. Um, so, so we are getting a bit too euphoric about this I think so. yeah, and retail. Yeah. I, I think so. I think, you know, when, when you get down to the real metrics and measuring return on capital and return on investment in these businesses, I think only the Indian businessmen can really pull it off. It's a bloody difficult business. And then you start to apply all the metrics that we're used to in the Western part of the world on same store sales and, you know, running this thing efficiently. But you look at the struggle these people have every day to open a new store or to open a new outlet. It's a hell of a struggle. Life is just not easy. Uh, so while we're all euphoric about retail and consumer, I think you'll be very mindful that a good scale platform, difficult to come by. The other, the other sector where there's been a lot of euphoria after the FDI cap was raised was aviation. Most players bleeding yeah, out no. there. Is that even I'm not a sector too focused, I'm, I'm, I'm not too focused on aviation. Uh, and we'll see where that goes. Mm. But I think the, the consumer sector should really benefit the most, the retail sector. If you've got great distribution and you can sell more products and more brands, I think there's a lot of upside. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk about infrastructure. I mean, you have a play going with a cement company. Uh, you've been uh, uh, you know, involved very closely again, and I think that's a strategy you adopt typically, that you are not just coming in, putting in the money, but you're actually working with these yeah. managements where you've invested. Is that an area, or is that kind of a play on infrastructure, cement as a sector? Yes, it is. You know, core infrastructure is not what mm -hmm. our funds do. So one way to play infrastructure and housing is to play it through uh, the derived demand. So cement clearly is one, one commodity. And India, interestingly, you know, cement is a branded commodity and it's sold by actors and actresses and, you know, all kinds of advertising that goes on. So we, 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 we obviously have a terrific partner in, uh, in Dalmia Cement with Puneet at the helm of affairs. And I think it's a great example of where we partner with people early. We structure uh, the entire transaction which suits their needs and our needs. And it took us about a year to do the transaction. Now we've been invested for about two years. And we thought at that time we were, you know, at the bottom of the cycle. I think we've still been at the bottom of the cycle. You know, it really hasn't picked up in terms of demand. But just operational efficiencies, better marketing, better logistics, better sales optimization, you know, these kind of aspects that we can bring to bear. Again, it's only possible when you have a good business partner with you. You know, it's easy for a private equity to talk about it. You know, a good partner, you implement some of these good practices and, you know, the company is doing extremely well. And I think we're still, at the, we're still somewhere in the trough of the cycle. We yet haven't come out of it. And then if you look ahead, if, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a company which is now humming along pretty well. So if the, if the whole cycle turns and infrastructure picks up and housing picks up and some of the state politics get, get stable, Infra spending starts, I think cement can be a very, very interesting play. Let's talk about the biggie then, uh, the one which is closed, Bharti Infratel. Uh, most of the other private equity guys actually sold out. You've chosen to stay on, uh, you know, for the long term. 
At the same time, lots of clouds around the whole telecom sector space. The valuations that have been managed are way below what you had invested in. Are you still bullish on the telecom sector? So I think, firstly, obviously, I won't comment on exactly <coughs> the valuation and stuff like that. It's, it's all there in the, in the public yeah. space, and frankly, that's uh, uh, Bharti and Fretel's uh, domain. I think we clearly uh, like to stay invested for the long run. Uh, and I think we we feel that it does get better from here for the telecom sector as the noise dies down and hopefully the auctions go through and the build-out starts again and gives some credit hopefully to 3G in the future. I think we we may see a pickup in, in demand again and I think the growth could sort of come back in the sector. And, you know, we, we want to stay invested with, again, a terrific quality, one of the best in terms of a promoter group. Uh, it is, the thesis always was to be invested in a passive infrastructure, uh, and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, we think it's a little early to exit, so we'll just stay in there. And I think there is... I mean, I don't know the upside or downside from here. I have no idea, but I just think that it's you, a You believe the clouds company. will clear as far as the telecom? I think so. I, I think if you have a view, I think we think the clouds will clear. And there's, again, another way of derived demand play. You know, you play it through the, through the back end, basically. Let's talk about power. You've got an interesting investment there as well, Savanta Power. So you've pretty much got three in different infrastructure spaces. Yet you in one way or another, yeah. In one way or the other. Yeah, the... Um, yeah, I, I, th I think in power, clearly, there is uh, <clears throat> a big opportunity for India. I think, look, that's a sector that is lagging behind big time right now. And, you know, whatever we talk about India, it comes back to investing in power and how can India get the power situation right. And, you know, you, you, you see for yourself how difficult it is to get greenfield assets off the ground in this country. And I think that really goes to the point where we started the conversation that, you know, what will make us more confident once so again, not a specific comment on Avanta itself, but it just goes to show how difficult it is for Indian businesses to create a greenfield asset in the right sector with the right expectation of returns. This is not a consumer sector, so the return expectations are very different. And yet how difficult it is to create. You know, you fall behind schedules, you know, you don't get the land. And not again a comment on Avanta, but in general, the kind of stuff we hear in the sector. So, uh, you know, when, when you asked me in the beginning, uh, am I a bit positive? I really don't think it can get anything but better from here. Uh, and as you integrate the southern grid into the north, east, and the west, and I think hopefully the, you know, you have parts of India that are power surplus, other parts are paying 15 rupees a unit. It's, 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 quite, a, it's quite a crazy thing. What's the biggest challenge you face, Sanjay, when you have to draw down global funds? Because you have a global fund kind of a system where you would probably need to go back and say, look, here is an opportunity. Is it more a question mark on India and where it's going at this point of time? Or not is it really. more about quality about, companies, quality investments not being available? <clears throat> yeah, I don't think it's about India. number of deals, you would agree that it hasn't been a great year in terms of number of deals. Right. How, what, what is the bigger challenge? Is it to find those quality companies where you can put in money? Or is it about selling the India story itself? No, not the India story. So let's get out of the way. I think the India story is never difficult to sell. Okay, we, we obviously know the country pretty well. We have a team that's locally based. Guys like us are from India, based here. So I think uh, India story is never the issue. I think you're always going to have in, in this country, because of the macro headwinds that we have, it's about underwriting a rate of growth, which can be, you know, in the 20s and 30 percent, but when you come down to actually delivering that growth, it's a hell of a struggle for these business people, right? So, I think underwriting the, the sort of the, really was the right sensible growth number is is, is the biggest challenge, and uh, then, along with that comes the issue: what do you pay for these businesses, right? Mm. And as you know, Indian businesses always like to demand a premium to public companies, so uh, it's interesting. We have and even in these bad times, you're saying that yeah, yeah, they didn't relink. You no, 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 I don't think so. I think it's still a, you know, it's still the... <laughs> Let me get yeah, as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, and look, why not? I mean, look, quality businesses do command a premium. So it really boils down to an issue of, I think, valuations here. And, and what uh, you're saying is there is no other way in which you're going to be pushed to the table either because 
entities like banks who would normally push you and yeah. say, okay, look, that's not happening either. It's not happening in a hurry. So, for good quality businesses, good business models from from a good stable, I think you you're really going to have the biggest challenge is going to be valuations. So, as I said earlier, unless the unless the businesses want um, the long term capital that private equity brings in with all its um, advantages <coughs> of globalization, operational efficiency, you know, uh, improvements in the businesses. It's, it's not going to be easy. My final question, do you believe uh, going by the deal pipeline or the negotiations or the conversations that you're having, do you believe 2013 could see more deals than 2012? You know, I think it, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, I don't think it can be a slower year than what one has seen in the industry. Uh, so again, I think it gets to the point that it probably gets more active from here. But you know, I think we get all boils down to finally the macro environment. I think at the end of the day, uh, India for growing will need a lot of capital. Okay, all aspects of India. And there just isn't enough local long-term capital. End of story, when you have a fiscal deficit of this size, and you know, with savings and investment rates falling, mm. there is no choice but to get long-term capital. And if it's not available here, and if they don't unlock the insurance and pension money, then you will have to get it from overseas. And the one thing I just keep saying is that don't tide over that by just inviting short-term dollar flows. Let's try and have an environment where you have the long-term money coming in, which is going to be a lot more value added. So I think it, it sort of gets much better from here. And look, I think the government recognizes that. And frankly, they're not coming in the way of deal-making. So I don't think it's, it's the government's issue. Uh, I think the businesses have to feel good about investing. And when they want to raise money, I think they will be a huge pool of capital globally available for India because it's, you know, all the demographics are intact and it's still a land of massive promise. And uh, again, going very where you started about my friend who came here, Henry McQuay, you know, I tell you, it's not just that he came and talked about temples. I mean, these guys really love this country. Mm. Foreigners love this country. There is a love that they have for the people. Just now needs to translate into making money and some more deals for you, right? <laughs> and I think for India to just deliver on a kind of a macro basis as well, yeah. Have to. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Sanjay. We've had a tough year, but good to see you smile. Thank, Thank you very you much. Well. All right, that was Sanjay Nair of KKR here on In Conversation. Keep watching Bloomberg TV India.